alaikum. Thank you for staying and uh, listening to this, the last part of our workshop today, which is on fostering and creating masajid that are not only legally sound and healthy in terms of their governance, but have a healthy culture, have a culture that invites people in, that makes people want to be a part of your community, a place where people feel they belong. And that's a project we worked on for the past two years at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, for which I am Director of Research. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Dalia Mugahid, and I'm so happy to be here with you this afternoon. So very quickly to introduce our think tank, for any of you who's, who have not heard of it, who, who are not familiar, ISPU conducts objective solution-seeking research that empowers American Muslims to develop their community and fully contribute to democracy and pluralism in the United States. And we do that by making impact in three areas, social policy, public policy, and thought leadership. In the first, we help the American Muslim community develop. In the second, we help make sure American Muslims can fully contribute to society. And in the final one, we provide a platform for innovation and strategic thinking. And we do that by doing three things. We discover, we do the research, rigorous academic research uh, at, at the uh, gold standard of, uh, in the industry. But we don't stop at research. We also educate the public and we enable practitioners to, to make better decisions with better research. So this project that I'm so excited to share with you today is, um, is one that, um, that ISPU took on several years ago. And really, it was in, a, in response to a need, uh, a growing need of, um, of young people, of women, of converts, of a lot of other people who felt that their masajid were not places that they felt comfortable. Their masajid were not places they felt they belonged that there was this growing uh, movement of, quote, the unmasked. And it wasn't that people didn't care about their faith. It wasn't that they just simply weren't interested in being a part of a mosque. It was, it was different. It's they felt they didn't have access. They felt that they didn't belong. So why do mosques matter? Why does it matter for people for, for us to care about you know, sitting here together and, and thinking about how to bring people back to the mosques. Well, mosques are good for society. Mosques are actually good for America, contrary to what you may have heard on cable TV. Mosques make people better citizens. So frequent mosque attendance is linked to A, more volunteerism. People are actually working together to solve problems in their communities if they go to a mosque more frequently. These two things are linked. Better mental health outcomes, less anger and less sadness is linked to going to a mosque more frequently. And finally, higher civic engagement. People who attend a mosque once a week or more are more likely to vote and to be, uh, and to be involved in, in uh, their, their dem democratic systems. And yet, mosques often are alienating to many people, many parts of our community, including women, converts, and young people. So the challenges, you know, we, there are all these benefits, aside from the obvious spiritual benefits of going to a mosque. What are the challenges? Many young adults, women, and converts feel alienated from mosques. Mosque leaders also complain about the lack of volunteerism, the lack of giving back, and the lack of commitment of people who attend the mosque. And finally, mosque attendees complain about the lack of unity, the lack of a sense of belonging. So what makes mosques welcoming? When you have a welcoming mosque, what, what happens? Why, why should you care as a mosque leader, as a board uh, member, as an imam, why should you want your mosque to be welcoming? What do you gain from that? Well, at least these things happen. 
Why make your mosque welcoming? Because it increases volunteers, because it sustains your donors, because it increases cleanliness. People actually clean up after themselves. It increases spiritual engagement. It promotes stronger, more vibrant communities. It builds hubs for hope. It makes the mosque a place that is um, a, a service to society. It provides sanctuaries of support in what many people feel today is a hostile political and social environment. And it grows the next generation of Muslim Americans. So how did we find answers? We want to develop a vision for the prophetic mosque as a guide and a goal, and we want to do good research. So this project, the overview, the overall goal of reimagining Muslim spaces was to produce research driven recommendations for mosques that are both welcoming and a hub for hope, a place that's inclusive and engaging, and a place that is a source of service to the community. And we're only going to be talking about the first goal in this specific um, presentation, but if you're interested in, in the second on, on service-oriented mosques, please visit our website at ispu.org forward slash RMS, where you can read um, about that, that part of the project. Now, we accomplished this in the following ways. First, we did an extensive literature review. We looked at what other faith communities were doing in their congregations to make their places of worship more engaging to the, really the same demographics that we were looking at. We did focus groups across the country of Muslims, of Muslims in, uh, from diverse backgrounds, and including mosque leaders. We did an analysis of every available poll of American Muslims. We also did one-on-one -on -one interviews that were in-depth of mosque leaders and mosque attendees. And we got advice from a diverse task force of experts. So the outcome of that research is a report called Creating a Welcoming, Inclusive, Dynamic Mosque. And you can grab the executive summary of that report outside, and you can read the whole report on our website. We also created case studies on uh, communities that had created these service um, projects within their mosque to create a mosque that serves humanity as a whole. So you can find out real life, this isn't theory now, real life situations of communities who built uh, you know, a job training center or, or a health clinic. And you can find out their, their successes as well as their struggles and learn from the, that experience. We also have a community toolkit on our website and links to other resources. And you can get all of that at ispu.org forward slash RMS. And these are our case studies, as I mentioned, for a service-oriented mosque. This was our research team. Um, Dr. Hassan Begbi, who's really one of the, the leading um, scholars on mosques in America, was our primary investigator. And we had a number of other researchers, and I, I was the director uh, of research uh, overseeing the project. We also had some wonderful, well-known names on our task force. Um, People like uh, Hazem Bata, who was the Secretary General of uh, ISNA, um, Hin Mekki, who has been writing extensively on women and mosques, um, and, and Sarah Saeed, who, who has also done the same. Maryam Iskandari, one of the leading architects of mosque uh, design in America and, and others. So project findings, what, what did we discover by doing all of this research? Well, first, let's talk about who this community is. Let's just start by laying out some, some facts. American Muslims are the, by far the youngest community in America, the youngest faith community. Um, almost a quarter of American Muslims are between the ages of 18 and 24. The median age for American Muslims is a full 25 years younger than the average median age. So a very young community. Now, young people in the general public are less likely than their elders to attend a religious service once a week. They're also less likely than their elders to say religion's important. 
So this issue of, of religious communities losing their young people is not unique to Muslims. But there is something different about the Muslim community. Young Muslims are also less likely than their elders to attend a, um, a mosque or a religious service once a week. But what is different about young people in the Muslim community is they're just as likely to say religion is important. So their lack of attendance or the fact that they're going less frequently than their elders is not because they value their faith any less. There is something else going on. So unlike their, their age peers or their generational peers in other faith communities, um, Muslim young people value their faith very highly. I mean, if you look at, compare 18 to 29 year olds in the general public, where 56% say that their faith is important, and Muslim young people in the same age group, where 91% say their faith is important. Their faith is there, but there is something missing in, in their engagement with the mosque. Muslims are also by far the most ethnically and racially diverse faith community in America. We're the only faith community with no majority race. Every other faith community is predominantly white, as you can see, but Muslims are um, really uh, a, a mix where uh, at least a quarter of us uh, identify as black, 24% identify as white, 18 and, uh, identify as Asian, and 18 as Arab. And then we have 7% that just call themselves or identify as mixed race, and then 5% who identify as Hispanic. Um, and these numbers, you know, vary depending on the poll, but what we know is that we have no majority race. There is not one race that, that can say um, they, uh, they are the, the majority. Uh, with this kind of diversity, is opportunity. It can also create tension. And I think it's important um, to understand that this project is not, or what my presentation today will not look at inclusivity of race. It's an incredibly important part of the conversation. It's not a part of this presentation. But we do have a report on getting race right in our communities and in our mosques on our website. Um, and I encourage you to look at that. Another way we're diverse, besides the fact that we're you know, racially diverse and we're also very young, is that half the community was born outside the United States and half was born inside the United States. So there's diversity in immigrant status as well. There's uh, sort of different uh, opinions of, on Muslims' um, economic base. And what we actually found out is that Muslims were the most likely faith community in America to report low income. So more than a third of our community is, has a household that is living below the poverty line. Um, we also have a lot of rich Muslims, so there is incredible economic disparity in our community. And it's interesting, this economic disparity lines up, like the rest of America, with our racial diversity. Um, it's a function of being in America that racial diversity is reflected in economic disparity as well. So now we're going to talk about the most exciting part of the presentation, which is on creating welcoming masajid for women. So I want to start with uh, this, um, this ayah, this, this verse from the Quran, from Surah At-Tawbah, that I think really encapsulates the spirit of, uh, of the relationship between men and women in Islam. And of course, this is just a, a translation of the Arabic. The believing men and believing women are guardians of one another. They advocate virtue, forbid evil, perform the prayers, practice charity, and obey God and his messenger. These, God will have compassion on them. God is noble and wise. I think this is a very important place to start because not only does it set the stage, kind of calibrate us, but it also, I think, makes a very important point in that this ayah was from Surah At-Tawbah, as I, as I just said. And Surah At-Tawbah, if you are familiar with the circumstances of its revelation, is it was not a time of ease. It was not a time of comfort. It was actually a time of crisis. It was an existential threat that the Muslims were facing. 
And yet this ayah is part of that surah. So I make that point to say that crisis does not mean we set aside these concepts. It's actually when we have to bring them out even more. It's when they are the most important, that we have to honor the rights of every member of our community. So I want to start by setting the stage of where American Muslim women right now are um, psychologically, just in terms of the recent election, the, the climate of fear and hostility. So we found in our recent poll at ISPU that Muslim women were more likely than Muslim men to suffer post-election. And this manifests in a number of ways. So first, we asked people if they had suffered emotionally with stress and anxiety enough to believe that they need the service of a mental health professional. So we actually set a bar for what we mean. And nearly one in five of Muslim women said yes to that, and significantly more likely to, to feel this kind of level of stress um, than men. Muslim women were also slightly more likely to say that they had actually made plans to leave the country if it becomes necessary. Now, I want to I want to just kind of clarify this question. This is not about Muslims not feeling American. This question was posed to Americans of all faiths, and there was a significant minority in all marginalized communities, in all uh, vulnerable communities in America including the African-American community at large, the Latino community at large, um, even Democrats, right, who said that they had made plans to leave the country. So this is a measure of a sense of vulnerability, not a sense of whether or not someone feels this is really their country. But here's where it really becomes alarming. Feared for your personal safety or that of your family, from white supremacist groups like neo-Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan. And you have 47% of Muslim women saying that they had uh, had this experience of this fear. And so let's just, you know, as a, as, a, as a baseline, there is an enormous amount of anxiety and fear right now in, in our community at large, but especially when it comes to Muslim women. Muslim women, Arabs and young people are also the most likely to have experienced religious-based discrimination, okay? Discrimination based on their faith. So it's, it's you know, two of the groups that we're focused on in, in this specific um, presentation. Women are, are facing discrimination more than men. Um, they are really bearing the brunt of Islamophobia as are young people compared to el uh, older folks. Um, so I'll translate a little bit. The first, uh, two, um, the first two bars are comparing men and women, and women are far more likely than men to have experienced some level of discrimination. Then we look at three age groups, young people more likely than older people in, in the Muslim community to have uh, experienced discrimination, and then we look at different um, ethnic groups, black, white, Asian, and Arab, and it, Arabs are the most likely to say that they have experienced faith-based discrimination. But what, how are people responding? So Muslim women are more likely than men to take action after the election. So the sense of fear, or the sense of insecurity, they're actually signing up for self-defense classes, 16%, which is kind of significant, as a result of the election, have, have uh, signed up for self-defense classes. Um, they're also increasing their donation to organizations associated with their faith community, and more likely to do that than men. 29% have not decreased, but increased their, their donations to their faith community. What, where they're not different, which is kind of surprising, is, is in the middle one. They're not modifying, or they're not more likely than men to modify their appearance, to be less identifiable as a member of their religious community. So despite the fact that they're more targeted, Muslim women are not more likely than men to hide their identity. And it shows the level of um, resilience that we're, we're seeing. Now, the other important piece of uh, data is that not only according to ISPU's poll, but several other polls, that there is no statistical difference 
in the, level, the frequency of mosque attendance between men and women in America. And this always comes a little bit as a surprise. Um, and yes, 45 and, and 35 appear to be different, but they're actually statistically identical numbers. So women are similar to men in, in the frequency by which they attend the mosque. And I want, to, I want to point out one really important thing, is when I was with Gallup, we asked this question not only in America, but all over the world. And any other country, including Europe, women were significantly less likely than men to attend a religious service once a week. It was actually only in America, the only country in the entire world, where there was parity in, in, in mosque attendance between men and women. So it's, it's an interesting, unique, phenomena here in, in this country. What does this mean, though? If there is similarity, almost parity, in attendance, then shouldn't that parity also be reflected in resources and space? Now, when it comes to what the role of the mosque is. This is, you know, you talked about uh, issues of domestic violence earlier in the day. Well, this. This is for the first time ever we now have numbers around domestic violence and how the Muslim community compares to other communities. So we ask this question, do you know a person in your faith community who was a victim of violence from someone in his or her family in the past 12 months? By this we mean domestic violence. We just wanted to sort of clarify it. What we found is that Muslims were as likely as Catholics, Protestants, non-affiliated Americans, and the general public to say that they knew someone. No more, no less, it was equal. Muslims are also as likely as members of other faith communities to report the problem or to report the incident to a law enforcement official. Again, no difference. Where Muslims were unique was that they were more likely than other faith communities to also report it to a faith leader. So there's this role that imams and mosques are playing when it comes to domestic violence that even other faith communities aren't, aren't uh, being uh, called on in, at the same level. And, and there's, there's some really interesting implications for that. So you have 51% of Muslims saying that it was reported to a faith leader, you know, compared to just 28% um, of the Jewish community, just a less than a quarter of Catholics, um, just over a third of Protestants and so forth. What, what that means is a couple of things. First, the obvious one, imams have to be trained, have to know what to do when this happens, have to have, to have some at least basic um, psychological or social service training so that they are responding effectively when, this, when someone comes to them with this problem. But second, it also means that from the perspective of the victim, they are looking to their community, or they're looking to their faith, or they're looking to their imam as a source of support. You're not going to go to someone to report it if you think this is condoned in your faith, or you know they had, the, the person who hit you had, didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of God. There's no reason to go to an imam in that case. But there is a sense among victims that this is wrong and at least half of them are going to an imam for support. Uh, and, that, and I think that that's an important point to take home when it comes to the kind of environment, the kind of climate we need to um, uh, create and, and, and foster in our message for women. So what are the kinds of things we heard? Now, we, from women in, in our message, or from women in our focus groups, these are some of the responses. I hate the fact that I can't see the speaker while in the balcony. It drives me nuts. So visual access to speakers it was something that came up a, a thousand times. Just being in a place where you're not even involved with the speaker. You don't, have, you don't actually have visual access with the speaker. When I see a woman <clears throat> on the board, I automatically feel that the mosque is more open to women. That was just a signal to some people that this was a place where they would feel comfortable. So before we go into our recommendations, we thought we'd start with the Fiqh Council. 
and what they in their statement on women and mosques. So the Fiqh Council of North America and um, scholars such as Yasser Qadi, Omar, so Omar uh, Shaheen, Omar Suleiman, and Muhammad Majid uh, has, has uh, signed on to the following statement. We call upon masajids to ensure that women have access to the main musalla to perform salah, listen to the Jummah khutbah, or attend and participate in lectures or discussions. <clears throat> the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not have a formal shura process, but he did set the example of consulting with all segments of the Muslim community, including women. Masajid in North America, however, do have formal decision-making mechanisms, and it is therefore incumbent that women participate in all processes of formal shura, including serving on the governing bodies of masajid. So, our recommendations for creating an inclusive environment for women. The first being, women should have the key here is the choice, to pray in the main musalla or in a separate area. Second is women should, have, should be able to serve on the masjid board and be a part of masjid leadership. 